Thank you, and thank you for the warm welcome. And it's a pleasure to be in this uh, panel discussion with a bunch of uh, uh, experts from different uh, areas, but uh, focusing on the uh, main area that's low code um, and how it is helping today's development. So I'm touch, going to touch based on a specific uh, uh, area that is basically how we can connect uh, low code and pro code uh, based on the interaction. you got some background about me, but um, as an update, I am telling the WSO2 story while providing strategic consulting for many organizations. And my talk is basically uh, based on the learnings that I got from these different uh, organizations. So if you look at uh, an enterprise, um, this is how I see the uh, inside the enterprise. Developers are there, they are building applications, but uh, these are two camps that we see some working on the low code tools and some working on the pro code tools. So the problem that I see in this uh, uh, setup, those are not connected. And sometimes uh, mainly the low code stuff are treated as shadow IT and the pro code stuff treated as uh, the enterprise IT. And those are not connected, not shared and not reused in many organizations. So developers are lost as well. And culturally, these two groups or two camps are separated inside the organizations as well. So with the, um, the traditional layered setup inside organizations, traditional hierarchical setup in the organizations, did, this might uh, did work, but uh, with the modern uh, agility coming into the picture as well as decentralization of the teams, this doesn't work anymore. So that's where we have to find a problem. So if you look at in detail about this issue, even I wrote an article inside Forbes that I have put the link in my slide. So there are many problems in the current setup in the low code market. And I think this is something we can discuss in detail at the end of the presentations as well, since we have a number of uh, experts from different um, areas. The first problem that I see is uh, the low codes are mainly targeting uh, citizen and ad hoc developers. So that's um, one issue. And the most of the low-code platforms are ignored the pro developers who is uh, working on certain uh, areas of the application development. So because this um, uh, target audience is citizen and ad hoc developers, tools are optimized for the citizen and ad hoc developers. And when a pro developer uh, comes and try to use these um, low-code platforms, they find it not that productive or that not that helpful for a pro developer. So that is the first issue I see. And another issue that I see the low code platforms are, I, I'm not telling every low code platform, but most of the low code platforms are one way. That means if you try to change the diagram uh, and uh, change the code, you cannot go and edit the code outside the low code platform. If you change the code, then it doesn't work uh, inside the uh, low code tool because uh, that graphical representation doesn't work in most cases. So that is uh, why I use the term one way. Uh, so you have to always depending on the graphic in the most of the low code platforms that we see in the market. And then the, uh, the third point as a developer, and if I put my developer hat, this is the most critical point for me. The fun of development is basically you uh, design it, you write the code, you test it, you push it to the, uh, uh, the uh, push it through the pipeline and then go back to uh, develop, debug. I think this is the life cycle of the development and that is where we are having fun most of the time. But most of the low code development tools are not supporting fundamental of uh, the uh, development life cycle, like how you uh, version control using a traditional version control system like Git or um, uh, any other version controlling system. And then the lack of testing and debugging support. Uh, there are a certain level of debugging, but it is not enough for a pro developer as well as it might be not enough for a, to debug a critical um, problem that we see in some of these systems. So that is another key issue. And then in the integration, because you have to integrate with many things, right? Like um, the code uh, quality, 
type of stuff and then test automation related systems and various other uh, systems that we find in the development ecosystem need to be connected uh, when it comes to a proper development environment and lack of integration or limited integration that we see in the low code platform is another issue that we see and then another thing is most of the low code um, uh, the platforms are developed using proprietary standards so there's a vendor locking comes behind the uh, these tools as well so that is another problem that i see these are not only the problems but uh, from my priority list these five i can highlight so uh, what i'm planning to do during my session basically try to find solutions to this so striking out these things is the easiest way but that is not uh, the correct way to handle this so that's where i'm trying to find a few uh, suggestions to the market on how we can handle these problems the first thing is about the democratization of development i think um, that's very important because that's a common skill gap issue that market is speaking as well as we are facing on a day to day basis. So how we can democratize this development, bring citizen developers, ad hoc developers and pro developers together into a single code base and uh, provide them different type of tools based on their technical uh, capabilities and get them involved in the project. As example, if we take a um, agile team. There can be business users or domain experts coming from the business side who can contribute a bit to the code. And then there are average developers who would like to use um, uh, the low code part of the problem, who has a great domain knowledge and might be not um, willing to do a deep dive into the code. And there are pro developers inside the team. How they can connect and democratize this development is the first way of handling and overcoming the problem of focusing only for citizen and ad hoc developers. Then the graphical and textual parity is critical to uh, have a two-way um, uh, combination. Like you can edit the diagram as well as you can edit the code. Because as a developer, sometimes it's easy to use a graphical view and create a skeleton or a create a, uh, the structure of the code. But sometimes it's fun to edit the code as a developer. And uh, personally, I feel it's really productive uh, uh, in some cases to do the actual code in rather than working on the graphical side. So having that graphical and textual parity will help to uh, address that type of developer behavior as well as developer desire to do the development and then the um, uh, the if the tools can target and understand the developer zone and have a single code base and how they can inbuilt different type of standards and tools into the development process of the uh, low code workflow will address the problems that I explain about how developers can be more productive as well as have fun when they are doing the development. Then the integration basically understanding the ecosystem have a way of connecting to various systems because in the modern architecture connectivity is really easy even tools provide the uh, API so uh, tools are having a high programmability that you can connect uh, to these tools using various API so command line um, uh, uh, tools and then the extensibility because you can't just stick to set of tools you should have the extensibility in the uh, local tool itself how you can connect to these various uh, other systems and ecosystems that you see then the last point I highlighted about the vendor locking so how we can come out of the vendor the locking basically is using open standards so there are many open standards available and without um, kind of adding too much of uh, vendor specific stuff into the open standards how we can highlight open standards as much as possible is uh, the best way as an example if the low code platform developing uh, apis what about using open api specification what about using async api specification because most of these stuff are well documented and standards are available so using this open Open standards will uh, minimize the vendor locking and um, make the code base more clean as well as you can take it to any platform and do the development. So that is my uh, the last suggestion to um, get, in, get out of the vendor locking. So then uh, if you look at the title of my uh, talk, basically I'm speaking about how the platform can um, uh, 
provide all these together as a solution. And there are many definitions for a platform. And uh, my favorite one is a platform is a support structure that increases the effectiveness of a community. In this case, the community is the developers, all the developers inside the enterprise with different type of capabilities and different type of expectations. How we can bring them uh, together using a platform is what I'm going to explain in detail during my session and then use the platform as a way to uh, connect low code and uh, pro code and cross that uh, chasm using the platform is where I'm going to focus. So that is kind of a very brief uh, description about um, what I'm planning to do uh, during my session. And I'm going to welcome you on August 24th uh, to uh, uh, join my uh, talk. And I will explain in detail about how we can find a solution for this problem with a bunch of uh, industry experiences that I got while working with many enterprises uh, globally. So that's a, a quick overview about my talk and uh, I would like- well, Thank you everybody for joining today, the, the Global Book uh, the Big Data Conference. I'm really excited to be here. Um, as mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about the importance of governance. So we often talk about the, you know, the different tools and what they can do. Uh, but the topic that I wanna to touch on, I think is a really important one is, is specifically around governing these tools. Uh, and I'm going to be focusing on the Microsoft Power Platform, which is uh, the Microsoft version of the Velcro tools. And if my promoter is going to wake up, then I may even use it or not. Okay. Um, so a little bit about myself. So Mr. Modi already mentioned, but uh, I'm very passionate about automation, about just simplifying life as much as possible. Uh, I really much embrace any types of business as well as personal tools uh, to allow automating things in life. So in the business front, I do a lot with, with my different clients. Uh, more recently, I've actually used the platform to develop a solution for one of my daughters who developed diabetes to make it easier for her on a day-to-day -day basis on tracking all of her information. So when you think about these type of tools, you're not always going to be limited to just business. A lot of it is also going to be applicable to uh, um, uh, to your personal life. Um, so I'll give some of my contact information. I do a lot of conferences. I do a lot of public speaking. Um, I really try to do as much as I can with blogging. So really giving back to the community wherever I have an opportunity. Um, I've also provided a link on the slide that you should be able to see here. Uh, if your company is using the Power Platform and is interested in, in or starting to use it and want to learn more about it and trying to get a, kind of a, a current state assessment, uh, I would urge you to actually take a look at that, uh, that URL. Um, all right, and so one thing that we've been seeing is ever since COVID has hit, there has been a very large uptake of automation. Why? Well, all of a sudden people are not in the office. So while companies may have been used to doing some manual processes or paper-driven, you know, you go knock to the economy boss on the door, uh, or do other things that are in person, that has now been taken away. So you're now working a lot more virtually, the, the distributed, and you have to be able to still do the same processes, but you don't want to slow down business. So we are in 2022. I'm still seeing companies where an employee, for example, wants to go on vacation, they have to go to the internet, they have to download a form, fill it out, scan it, send it to a manager, wait for an approval, and then that has to be scanned or emailed to HR to then put into the system to do that application dates. Very, very inefficient. And uh, as we just heard, there's a lot of tools available today, low code, no code. I recently did a survey in uh, LinkedIn to find out all the companies that are using the Power Platform, how many of them are actually governing it? How many are using it versus just letting people say, oh, it's a low code solution. Let's just roll it out and start using it for the different people. And so I was actually surprised to find out that almost 30% uh, um, are not managing the Power Platform at all. They're not governing it. All they're saying is turn it on and let the users have fun. Let them use it for productivity and uh, uh, whatever they want. And so again, the Power Platform and these local solutions are great. They can save a lot of time. You can build solutions very, very quickly uh, solve important business processes, especially if they're slow or they're, they're having a batch. 
But you better remember that with these type of tools, there is an element of risk, right? So um, it, it, when you're building the solutions, you need to have access to the system. So for example, if I do something in SharePoint, I need to have the same level of access in order to interact with my data. If the access is not there, I can't build the tools. If the access is there, I can leverage the tools to build solutions, but it comes at a risk. If I built the, my solutions the wrong way, I can actually do something that is going to have a negative effect. And so by introducing governance into these type of platforms, you're not going to necessarily eliminate all the risks, but you're certainly able to mitigate it and try to avoid it as much as possible. Uh, so for those of you who don't know about, about what the Park platform is, it is a collection of tools that allow you to build low-code or no-code solutions. Uh, so very quickly, you've got your Power Automate, that is uh, building workflows. Uh, Power BI allows you to visualize your data and build analytics. You've got your Power Virtual Agents. Um, those are essentially chatbots that can be stood up within minutes, and you can hit, upload uh, questions and get an FAQ bot really, really quickly. Power Apps, that is your front-end form that you can build on a mobile device, in, in, uh, uh, on a desktop, embedded in a set of teams. Uh, again, very quickly, very visually rich. Uh, you have your Power Pages where you want to build external access. So if somebody, for example, would have clients uh, submitting information on a website without authentication, that's how you can do it. And then one layer underneath that, you've got your data connectors. Uh, so uh, I know that's something you were saying before that when you build a local solution, it's very vendor specific. So the Power Platform actually has over 500 different connectors available and it is meant to be very open-ended, very open, uh, open source. So you can look at the code, you can actually interface with any system, not just the, the system that you're working with. Um, you've got AI Builder. So that's where we start throwing uh, AI technology into the mix to then further enhance the solutions. Microsoft Dataverse, think of it as a cloud-based database, but rather than just being tables, it also has a level of logic associated with it, security business rules. So if you think about those of you who know Dynamics or have heard of Dynamics, those solutions are built on top of Dataverse. PowerFX is its own uh, part of the scripting language that's used by Power Automate and Power, by Power Apps, and it allows you to build formulas for doing data extraction, manipulation, and saving. Uh, and then there's some management tools that allow you to make, manage the, the platform. So taking all that, and that is a family of products that Microsoft gives users uh, and, and they can start using it essentially for free, depending on what functionality you're doing. Sorry, last one also. Okay, so when I'm going to be giving my session later this week or next week, I'm going to be talking about areas of governance. And there are some key areas you want to think about, whether it's Microsoft or whether it's another environment. The first one is establishing a governing body. Who is responsible for your low-code or no-code uh, technology or platform or solution, right? Is it something you just let in users install and run on their system, or is there a group of people who should be uh, aware of what's happening, understanding whether it meets the needs of the organization, uh, and control any sort of change? So that is the first thing you got to think about. The second area is going to be looking at licensing. Now, I'm going to be focusing specifically on the Power Platform, Microsoft's uh, solution. But again, if you're going to be using any sort of technology that falls outside of your standard toolkit that is available to your users, you want to think about licensing. Is it going to incur extra cost? If it does, does the cost offset or is the cost offset by the benefits that these type of tools provide to your users, right? So you may look at $10,000 a month sounds like a lot of money to spend. But if you calculate certain tasks that you're, that you're automating now, and if you're saving yourself even $12,000 or $50,000 a month in manpower, you have effectively offset the cost of the licenses. So again, things to think about. Um, security. So you want to know what people can do in the power platform. You want to be able to restrict what users have access to. You don't want them to just go and say, do whatever you want. Uh, monitoring. So related to security, you want to have monitoring. Monitoring is essentially a way to have eyes into the environment. 
What are people building? Where is it being run? Is it shared with anybody? Is there data that's being sent outside of the organization? Uh, is data coming in from outside of the organization? Where are things being hosted? There's a lot of these type of questions that you want to ask yourself to understand, again, how are these tools being used? Is it uh, increasing any risk? Is there any exposure to your organization? Then we have alerting. So related to monitoring, where monitoring is more passive, where your body, a governing body is going to be reviewing information, looking at dashboards, looking at reports. Alerting is more meant to be actively watching out for what's happening. And the moment that something happens, it will send an alert. For example, if somebody tries to send information outside or share a certain application with somebody else, even if it's internal and they're not allowed to, you want to notify them, hey, you're not allowed to do that. You maybe want to notify IT, do other things, maybe send them some educational information about here's a policy, here's the standard for how us, the organization, are using this specific tool. And the last one is about application lifecycle management. So again, uh, I can't speak to other local platforms, but the, the Microsoft Power Platform does support application lifecycle management, uh, DevOps, that is all part of, part of the integrated into the platform. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about when you're building solutions, what is the proper way to do it so that when you start going from development environment into a, uh, a testing environment, into user acceptance testing, and by finally going into production, you want to make sure that you're following the right program process, that it's a sound process, and if you need to then introduce some changes, how you go about doing it so that you're not affecting business users who are working in production. And so finally, when you're looking at kind of a, a, a whole roadmap when it comes to governance and assessment, this is a, a process that I've developed for Pertivity, where we start looking at uh, phase zero, which is a current state assessment. Again, I talk about the bar platform, but this does not have to be specific to this platform. It could be used for other technologies. First, we got to look at the current state. What is actually happening in the environment? How are people using it? How many solutions have been developed? Who's using them? Are there any sort of risks that have to be mitigated immediately? Then we go into phase one, which is the governance strategy. We're actually developing the procedures, the policies, the processes. Uh, we're starting to tie down and lock down certain things to avoid situations where users are actually uh, not able to do what they should not be able to do. Uh, then you're looking at governance deployment. So whereas in phase one, we are uh, defining what needs to be done, phase two, we're actually implementing it. And this is where we would be working with the organization, typically, who would be shadowing us or reviewing what it is we're doing to learn more about how to do things the right way. And then you go into governance optimization in phase three, and that is where us, for example, Opportunity would then work with the client to assist them and continuously evolve the governance because governance is not something that is static. It's something that changes over time as business needs are changing um, and as the new technologies are being rolled out. And so this is kind of the whole process we go through that I'm going to be covering in more detail on, uh, on our opponents. And I believe that brings me to... Oops. So that brings me to the final slide. So I've got some information here. Uh, again, I'll make myself more available if there's any questions. Thank you for that uh, warm introduction. Um, this is actually a really interesting topic given the, the two people who spoke before me because they clearly know a ton about the importance of no-code and low-code platforms, especially, <clears throat> excuse me, especially to developers. But the interesting thing about the metaverse is that it's being built as this new form of social media. So it's actually really important that there is a no code or low code solution, not just given to developers, but the average user to kind of make this technology stick and actually make it reach its uh, true potential. So during my talk next week, um, one of the things I'll be covering is just what is the metaverse? It's a topic that's gotten so much press recently. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But I think just starting off, it makes sense to define it as a space that combines aspects of the physical world and digital world. Um, I have four companies highlighted here. And the reason I went with these four is because I want to point out there won't be one metaverse, right? Like in Snow Crash or Ready Player One, where the metaverse idea came from, there was one metaverse 
in reality, we'll have a lot of different platforms that allow different things. Um, on top of the, these platforms are in browser, mobile, some use AR, some are VR only, some are in browser and VR. There's no real specification on what, you know, format of viewing the media you need to be in for it to be a metaverse. And then on top of that, the two things I kind of want to call out as we talk about this space is that um, the metaverse doesn't have to be gaming, right? Like Fortnite, Roblox, Rec Room, known as gaming platforms. But this idealized view of the metaverse is going to extend to much more than that. But the roots in gaming matter a lot because that's how the metaverse is getting built. And we'll get back to that in a second. Um, but the last thing I just want to identify here is that your metaverse doesn't have to include blockchains or NFTs or cryptocurrencies. It can be just, you know, what um, Rec Room is building where there is none of that or Fortnite and Roblox where they don't even plan to include any of that. So I think it makes sense to have a good understanding of the metaverse, but then also why it matters. Um, there are a few market number here, numbers here that I find interesting, right? Bloomberg valued the metaverse at about $400 billion in 2020, and they expect that to double by 2024. Uh, the interesting thing to note here is that the gaming segment was worth $275 billion in 2020, and advertising and software makes up 70% of that value. The one thing about the metaverse that I think people need to understand is they, as we work towards it, because we talk about all the social good they can do, is that it's a major tool for marketers. It's going to give brands new ways to reach customers, potential customers, and also track engagement. And I'm not just talking about likes or shares. I'm talking about tracking who actually interacts with your metaverse world, who builds things, who's actually putting in time to interact with your products. And you have the ability to now capture that information and turn that person into an evangelist. So for brands, the metaverse is going to be amazingly important. The other interesting thing that picked up and got picked up in the Bloomberg article was that live events are expected to make up about $200 billion of the market. Um, in During the pandemic, during lockdown, Ariana Grande, Travis Scott had concerts in Fortnite that millions of people attended. That's one really cool aspect of the metaverse that is going to be important as we go forward. It really allows people globally to connect with celebrities, um, art, things they enjoy without physically being here. And now the last thing I have on this slide is just some information about the creator economy. It's already worth about $100 billion. And you may be wondering what that has to do with the metaverse, but the metaverse really offers ways to unlock the potential of this creator economy. It really allows people to move their IP, be it audio, 3D art, 2D art, into a new space where fans can interact and they can monetize their work in new ways. So be it another form of social media, it's coming and it will be important for artists and enterprise alike. But the one thing and why this ties into the no code aspect so much is let's take a look at who's building it. Um, currently, it's video game developers. The metaverse is basically rooted in video game development. If you look at what you need to build a metaverse, you basically have the resume of a video game developer. You have someone who's creating virtual worlds where people can socialize. You have someone who's created features for in-game socialization, like chat. There's in-game payment systems and economies. There's digital assets that people can buy, sell, resell, and that's all stored in inventory system. In some games, owning certain things gives your characters um, special abilities, and that needs to all be tied together. The metaverse will have a lot of that. And the only people who've kind of built out a system with that in mind are video game developers. And then finally, the most interesting part about this overlap is the fact that video game developers design for real-time 3D graphics engines. Traditionally, those are gaming engines. If you look at what most metaverse platforms are built on today, there are a few companies that have their own proprietary renderers and, and 
graphic engines, but the majority of platforms are built on Unity or the Unreal Engine. Um, and the only people who really know how to build on that are video game developers. So I focus so heavily on video game developers because there's a clear skill gap that emerges. Um, we're saying that this is gonna be a platform that enterprises can use to really help extend their marketing reach. People are gonna to wanna to be on to socialize and express their creativity. But we're also saying that the only people who know how to build this right now are video game developers. And that's a little bit confusing because video games are not social media. So how do we open up this new 3D medium to users in the way that, you know, Instagram opened the world of um, photo content up to users? Um, how do we have people create things if they don't know how to code? I mean, Roblox is an amazing platform, but to build anything in Roblox, you have to need to, you need to know how to code in Lua. And then finally, if this is the, you know, the newest form of social media, in addition to all the other platforms we have out there, how do I create something for it, right? How do I create an experience that my friends can play around in? Or instead of sitting around in a traditional Zoom room, let's say I want to have a space that's, you know, tailored to me like my living room. How do I make that happen? Well, currently, you need to know how to code to do all of those things. And then if you are thinking about bringing in the blockchain or any aspects of NFTs, you also need to know how to code to do that. So we have this great potential, but there's a clear skill gap here between what people can actually do and in reality, what skills are required to actually create anything in this space. So I guess the main question and the main focus of my talk will be what is the next step in accessibility? I think it's no code platforms that democratize content creation. Uh, I have a little graph here showing NBC Universal going to YouTube and then on to TikTok. And I know that might not be exactly the same as the coding required to create a video game, but if you think about it, video editing originally started at a very high level. NBC Universal was kind of the they were the only people who had the cameras, the ability to um, edit videos, and they were the people that produced all the content. And then we had YouTube. And in the early days of YouTube, there were just random home videos posted on it. But some of the things that really took off on that platform still required some level of interest, some level of skill to actually understand how to set up the lighting, how to set up the editing, how to make sure the audio syncs up properly. So it wasn't something that you could just do with an iPhone. It wasn't, tech hardware wasn't there yet and neither was the software. And then we come to TikTok, right? It basically has turned your phone into a mini studio. It takes on all the hosting, all the editing, everything's done in app. It gives you a platform to output things to, and it's all captured with your iPhone camera. So that's pretty amazing. And if we're saying that we're going to be doing something similar with the metaverse, which is the end goal, how are we going to get there? What is that next step to really democratize content creation? Well, it's not all bad. There are some companies doing some pretty cool stuff in the space, and the industry has realized that they need to be able to give builders better tools to actually be able to express themselves, to be able to create things, and really share, share that user-generated content. I'll say this, it took seven years to go from photo bucket to Instagram, which in this analogy was photo bucket, a place for your pictures, to Instagram, a place for your pictures where they can be edited in ways that weren't possible previously. Um, we're on a much more accelerated path to getting to Instagram from photo bucket. There are a lot of companies doing some pretty interesting things to make 3D user-generated content a reality. And that's what I'll be talking about in my talk next week, understanding what tools are out there, what people use, and then also understanding what cool other things are out there in terms of plugins, right? You can have just your general world builder, but you can have AI brains for non-playable characters, 
chat bots and things like that, that all feature in your world. Um, so the industry is definitely moving in the right direction. We still got a ways to go, but it would be great to talk to you all and let you know what we're doing and kind of what solutions are out there. So with that, I'll end it for me and I look forward to seeing everyone next week. Oh, that's uh, thank you for that intro. And definitely uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to this conference after seeing the, the, the three speakers before me. That is fascinating information um, that we're going to be seeing next week. But uh, thank you for the kind intro and just my information, uh, my email, Jason B at Jason Barris. Super easy to remember um, if you want to get in touch after the conference. But what we're going to talk about at the conference is the low code capabilities of digital product design platforms. So um, the, the basic agenda is talking about challenges in software development, the promise of low code, no code, uh, digital product design platforms and low code, which could be a new concept to most people. It's something that Gartner came up with maybe five years ago. And there's, uh, there's organizations that do pieces of it. And really that's what we're going to talk about it and how it really does impact your software development. But the, the big thing and the reason we have this conference and the reason you're coming to this conference to learn so much is because of the complexity of software development. Already we've seen stuff from the previous speakers on you know, tools like Power BI, the challenges between the low code and the pro code, and then you start introducing the metaverse. Well, there's, there's two kind of themes there. there. There's complexity in building enterprise software, and this is a huge market for low code, no code. So Anytime you have like Microsoft investing so much money in the power platform, and that's really how they've kind of changed their whole go to market around the developer space, it means there's money to be made, which means there's a ton of great tools out there. But it doesn't mean every single tool is for you in the conference. So you want to figure out like, what is that continuum of tooling and what does it look like? And, and that's really what I'm going to talk about from prototyping to interaction design to design to code to sort of app builder type programs. But if you look at some of the data here, 50% of a developer's time is spent trying to fix issues that could have been avoided. How do those issues get avoided? They get avoided by using prototyping and design tools, but maybe you don't have a design team. So what do you do? Uh, problems in development are 10 times more expensive to fix than during design. So think about that. If you had a, a bug that you found before customers get that bug, it might cost $10 to fix. Once a customer gets it, it costs 100 But we all know this is the enterprise. So we're talking $10,000 to $100,000. So the scale is enormous. And just continuing on, into the market size, you know, 70% of enterprise CEOs see UX as a competitive differentiator. So how do these tools help you get that competitive edge? And then of course, how does that actually translate into revenue? So when you think about a digital product design platform, there's multiple aspects to this. What we're going to talk about in, in the session is the underlying um, sort of design system that will hold up everything that you see in my graph. And we'll look at screen design, user flows, prototyping, user testing, and usability testing, which the majority of you probably don't do, but you should be doing. Um, collaboration, co-editing, app building. So leaning over more towards that developer side versus that design side. Like what do designers use and what do developers use and how can we bring all of this together. And ultimately, what do developers want? Developers really want code that they can use. So there's a lot of promise in a lot of tools out there today that say, hey, we're going to help your enterprise development team accelerate product delivery, accelerate application delivery. But is that true? After some of my product demos, you will see, you'll be able to make your own decision. And so that's really my goal in this session is to make you aware of what these platforms are and then go into some different product demos, which have representative aspects of this bigger digital product design platform. So we'll look at tools like InVision, 
Adobe XD, which are very designer focused, but have these developer things that you might be able to do with them. A uh, tool like Figma, which is sort of taken over the world in the last few years. And how does Figma really help a developer team and a design team in a low code environment deliver product faster with less bugs? How does Sketch do that? The third item in my list here. It's really been a designer focused product. And I think Sketch, while maybe very popular still in a lot of organizations, tools like Figma have kind of risen up. And the reason is because they didn't just focus on designers, they focused on developers and designers. But you'll see how maybe Sketch can be used in parts of a digital product design platform to help you deliver product sooner. And then uh, Indigo Design, which is another tool which has kind of flipped a bit. It's got developer focus with some UX tools. So my goal with the session next week is to look at this from, you know, sort of the tried and true design team and developer team in your organization, which probably is working very separate today. How can you use tooling to bring those two groups together? And when I talk to CIOs, and VPs across the spectrum from some of the biggest companies in the world, what do they say? My biggest challenge is getting my design team to work with my development team. Hopefully by the end of my session and the end of all of the sessions next week, you will have some ideas and some pointers on which direction to go look where you can use the tooling available for designers, for developers, maybe throw in some prototyping, some user testing in there, maybe some code generation, but your ultimate goal of delivering digital products faster with less bugs on time to market. And of course, as everyone on today's call knows, within budget is probably what upper management cares about the most. So I'm pretty excited about being able to give this session next week. And I'm also excited to see some of the other folks talk because I think it all comes together into delivering great experiences for all of our customers. So thank you.